Can you believe this is our third interview? Uh, I can. Third interview. And in, none in of what, a, thir a three year or four year time span? Yeah, probably three or four. Three or four years, okay. Um, I think a lot has changed with me personally. I think physically I look different. Um, I think mentally I changed too. Um, the industry has given me a perspective on real life and a perspective on the industry as well. Because the industry is a different type of life. Get me? Right? So in that time frame, I feel like, well, I wasn't naive anymore because I already been through my, you go through stages, right? As an artist and, and everyone has been in a fucked up situation or been in a, a, a raw deal or signed a fucked up deal or was stuck in a deal, like a situation they wanted to get out of. Or I see a lot of artists nowadays like having to fire their management or they're stealing money from them or, you know, you know, even new artists. I'm seeing them dealing with, you know, they're stuck in a contract, a fucked up one, and they can't get out. And they got to take it to court and they got to get sued and, you know, People feel like they own you because you have a 10 year, or eight year or five year. They feel like you're in debt to them for that time period. And all this stuff that I'm seeing these other artists go through, guess what? I already went through all that shit, you know, very, very, very early on. And it's a good thing and it's a bad thing because it, it makes me like I'm definitely not naive, right? And I definitely have placed myself on a caliber as to where I'm not going to drop my worth because you don't think I'm worth X, Y, Z. In other words, if a label doesn't think that I'm worth, signing bonus doesn't even mean shit because at the end of the day, you got to pay all that back anyways. It's like an advance, but you end up paying for it. So don't get excited when someone says sign on bonus or advance. Like you're going to pay for all that shit. You're going to pay for it back. So, But they like to um, <clears throat> measure your worth on how much money they're going to give you in an advance. Right? So like artists like me, I'll be lucky if I even get six figures from a label. Right? But another artist, they might give them two million, five million. It's based on what the label thinks you're worth, not what you think you're worth. So, you know, um, <clears throat> that's just a lot of shit to keep in consideration. But I'm at a point in life where I've made a lot of money just off of my grit and my strength and my this, you know what I'm saying, and my integrity and my business sense, right? And, um, like, I'm just, like, stepping my game up. Like, I legit want to go back and take a course on, like, you know, financial advisory, like, CPA, shit like that, just so I can do better for myself, make better investments, do do smarter shit with my money. You get me? Like, <clears throat> you know, I could probably take a course for, like, eight months or ten months, you know, where I can learn how to do. It's funny because I did commodities brokerage, and... A part of that, I did that for a few years, and a part of that I was selling gold bullions, okay? And with me selling that and learning that, it intrigued me to invest in that type of thing. So I was smart enough, I invested in that, and I think gold is very smart. And I bought some bullions for my kids. So, you know, it's stuff you could put up in a safety box somewhere, bury it, whatever, hide it in the basement. But um, I just learned a lot of things, right? And um, even when I did real estate, you know, like I learned how to be my own boss. And I didn't do conventional real estate. Like, no, I didn't do the, oh, I'm trying to sell you a house and make 5%. No, like <clears throat> I went straight to the, man, I got 20,000. What the fuck can I do with this money? You know, I have 50000 Like, what, what can I do? You know what I'm saying? So I started out, like, going straight to the courthouse. 
Like every Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, I would go to the courthouse with my notepad. I would go where they keep the dockets in the case. They would do an auction every Thursday at 10 a.m. Basically, the auction were homes that were listed in the newspaper that were going up for sale. They were foreclosures. People lived in these houses, and they couldn't afford them for whatever reason. You know, people fall on hard times, lose their job, get sick, whatever. So I was like, hmm, what if, because whenever I went to the auction, I could never outbid the big investors because I have more coins than me. So I'm like, well, what if I... I got these people address, right? I got their name. So the go-getter that I am, I'm like, what if I go physically reach out to these people a month or two before the actual sales date and try to build some type of relationship with them, some type of rapport, and see how I can help them? But then I'm thinking to myself, bitch, you only got 50000 or 100000 cash to play with. Like, you know, you can't buy this house outright cash. Like, you can't buy this house. And see, the trick with that is all the houses in foreclosure, they had super-duper equity in them, okay? They had equity. Problem was the bank wanted their money. So me and my homegirl, we got dressed up very nicely, very professionally, like business casual. Not like fancy, but maybe jeans and a blazer, right? And some loafers. So I decided to make an LLC. I incorporated a business. And um, I'm going to give you an analogy of what type of business it was. It was kind of like, this wasn't the name of it, right? But the, the, uh, the, the concept of it was like, um, not we buy ugly houses, but like we can buy your house cash. Like we can save your foreclosure. Like um, we can stop your foreclosure type of you know, analogy. Like that was the whole concept. So I would go knock on these people's door. And this was me young as shit. Like this was the whole like, you know, early stages of like starting college and dropping out of college. This was like fresh out of high school, like 17, 18, you know, getting my feet wet type of thing, like learning the ropes, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm going out, I'm knocking on maybe 50 doors a day, right? The most houses I knocked on was like 80. And it was a lot of work. It was hot. It was a lot of driving, you know. I probably was driving for about 12 hours, you know, GPSing. So, okay, out of the 80 doors, whoever wasn't home, I left them a little brochure, a flyer, blah, blah, blah. Whoever was home, I'm like, let me shoot my shot. So I'm like, you know, my approach was different. Like, I'm not here to take your house. I'm not here to, you know, I'm here to help you, right? So my approach was a lot different. It's not like, I want to buy your house from you. How much are you going to sell to me? My approach was like, you know, you're a good person. You know, you're family oriented. How can I help you? Like, I know you got good credit or you had good credit because you had to been able to, to buy this house at one point, right? I don't know what your credit is like now, but having a foreclosure on your credit is not going to be a good situation because you got to wait whatever, seven years, however many years for it to come off. And you might eventually one day want to buy another house or even rent something. And, you know, people look at all that shit. So I, my approach is like, what if I could stop your house from going into foreclosure, right? Pay your mortgage off eventually. I'm not saying it's going to happen right now. It might take a month or two or three. But what if I can give you $20,000 right now in your pocket, cash? Would you quick claim your deed over to me, right? Let me deal with the bank. Let me deal with the attorneys. Let me deal with calling them, getting a payoff, negotiating the late fees, the forbearance. Let me deal with the bank. And in the meantime, I'll let you stay in the house. How does that sound until I can sell it? Might take me six months, might take me a year. So that's how I was making my money. And I was flipping, I started off my first deal, I did it with like 10,000. I gave them five grand, that was like my first deal. It was like a two bedroom condo, but it was worth something. It was near Singer Island in Palm Beach, 
West Palm Beach. Um, <clears throat> and the house had good equity in it, good comps. And I made like maybe at closing on that deal, I made like $123,000 at closing off of the sale. And that was after I paid off their, you know, their mortgage that they had. So I was like, okay, you know, like I need money now. That's why I was like, fuck college, fuck, you know. I, I just knew that I wasn't average and I knew I couldn't work for nobody. I knew that I couldn't get $6 an hour. I knew that I had a kid to feed. I knew that the lifestyle that I wanted to live wasn't going to be, you know, like a project's lifestyle. I knew I wasn't going to be on no Section 8. I knew I wasn't going to be on welfare. You know, I knew I wasn't going to be living off the government. I knew that I had to go out and get what I wanted to maintain the lifestyle that I wanted to live. So here I am. I have my own car. I have my own apartment. And I was happy as hell because I was still young, you know. And all my friends were still in the projects doing the same shit. Smoking weed, sitting on the porch, drinking. So that's how I started with the real estate. And it was a great hustle. I had a great run. Did that for over 10 years. Um, I still dib and dab in it now and then. But when I was doing that, it was full time. Like I had my own company. Like I was the one going out in the field, knocking on the doors, doing the paperwork, doing the negotiating, hiring the title company, blah, blah, blah. Now, <clears throat> I really don't have that type of time to invest, to go out and find these deals because nowadays you have to find them. They're not like, you gotta understand like the market has changed. Everything changed with the Federal Reserve, the interest rate changed, and it's a lot harder to even get financing for a house because they cut down on a lot of shit. Like back in the days when I was flipping houses, anybody could get a fucking mortgage. You could be a fucking school teacher making 30000 a year, boy. As long as you had a 620 Beacon score, you flying. And when I say flying, I mean through underwriting. Because back then, back in the days, it was like, okay, they did what's called stated stated. So as long as you had the credit, and even though I'm a school teacher and I make 30000 a year, I can tell you I make 500000 a year. I stated it. So it's not stated verified, meaning they weren't asking for tax returns, they weren't asking for W-2s, they weren't asking for POI, they weren't asking for none of that shit. As long as your credit was a six fucking 20, and see what ended up happening with the real estate game, and especially Florida, when the bubble burst, do you guys remember that? Okay. The housing market bubble burst. And everything flipped upside down. What ended up happening was 90% of the people that bought their home, they ended up going into foreclosure, you know why? They had the balloon mortgages. They had the flex, you know, interest rates. So they ended up, well, they couldn't afford it anyways. You know, so they were losing their house like the first six months. They couldn't make the payment because they didn't make the money to afford it. And a lot of them didn't have 20% to put down to avoid not putting their PMI in their mortgage loan. So to make a long story short, <clears throat> these people were upside down. So when I say upside down, it means they owed more on the house than it was worth, okay? So right around that time when the bubble burst is when I started losing money, okay? And I lost a lot of money. And I even got caught up in a Ponzi scheme. I lost a lot of money from a developer in South Beach. He duped me and like 30 other people. It was like a pre-construction thing for these high-rise condos, but it was a scam to make, you know, it was a big ass scam. So when the bubble burst and everything started going downhill, they made a lot of changes with, you know, just the whole Financial Lending Institute and the Federal Reserve. They made it so hard to get a mortgage. Are you listening to me? And I know from experiences because I've bought homes before. I've financed homes. I've bought homes cash. I've assumed mortgages. I've done all that. And from back then, to even just now, like the process, because I'm, you know, doing some investment stuff right now and I'm trying to get funding to work on something. And the process is about 200 times harder to get financing. And I'm talking about somebody with a 780 Beacon score. 
or almost 800 Beacon score. You got the credit score, but they don't give a fuck. Now it's like, okay, we want to see five years tax returns or two years tax returns. We want to see two years bank statements. You know what I mean? We want to see you get homeowner's insurance. We want to see how much your car note is. We want to see how much you pay for groceries, damn there. We want to see how much your car insurance is. We want to add all that shit up. And we want to see, are you going to be able to afford the $1,700 mortgage when you got $3,000 in bills to pay? And those $3,000 in bills are not your primary overhead. It's like your health insurance, your car insurance, your life insurance, your this insurance. Blah, blah. They want to know all this bullshit. You know? And then they make it difficult. They make you jump through hoops. Shit. I had a situation. Underwriting told me I had to close three of my fucking credit cards to close. And this was three days before closing. <laughs> and I said, I'm not closing my credit cards because, number one, I owe zero balance on all my credit cards. Four of my 11 credit cards were American Express cards. I'm not closing shit because some of my trade lines are over 10 years. And trade lines, if you don't have trade lines, it doesn't matter if you got a 900 or 800 beacon score. That doesn't mean shit because you, be, you could be what's called a ghost. You can have a credit score, but you have no history of revolving payment history, car note, mortgage, anything. So my dumbass, I told the underwriting, I'm not closing my credit cards. You know why? Because you didn't tell me this before. You waited till three days. You told me I had to go close it, and I'm not going to close my credit cards. This is going to hurt me in the long run, okay? And I knew this because I know a little something about your credit, okay? I know how to maintain good credit, okay? My dumbass wanted, and this happened to me last year. This was recent, okay? So I'm not talking about no, uh, this is recent. So my dumbass closed the three credit cards. I went and closed it. So they wanted proof in writing that the accounts were closed and I couldn't reopen them. What the bank said was it was a liability. It said it's a liability because one, you have too many credit cards. Even though you have zero balances and you have almost $90,000 of available credit limit that you have access to use, that if one month you can't pay the mortgage, you could easily put it on a credit card. They didn't give a fuck. It's like, you got to close it. You got too many credit cards. You got a credit card with a $20,000 limit. We, we need you to close. And I'm like, why? They said it's a liability because they're afraid that I'm going to max out my credit cards and I'm high risk. They're afraid I'm going to max my credit cards out and I won't be able to pay my mortgage. What they don't realize is <clears throat> for someone to have 12, 15 years of perfect trade line, meaning never missed the payment, never been late, never went over 10% of credit usage utilization every month, you know, paid it off before the grace period. Why would I sacrifice my good ass credit? And I bought houses before to max my shit out to where you feel like I won't be able to pay this mortgage. Do you get what I'm saying? So they make it so hard for you to get financing now, especially if you already have a primary resident and you're trying to buy like a second house for like investment purposes and you're not going to live there. Maybe you want to rent it out or you want to build. They make it almost impossible to, to get financing, even if you have the money for the down payment. They, they just, and that's what I realized. I realized, okay, you motherfuckers don't want me to get the loan. You don't want me to fucking do this shit. So guess what? I closed my three credit cards. Guess what happened? My score dropped 93 points. As soon as you close an account, your score drops. Okay? Your creditors look at you as a liability. Because you close that account and you have 15 years trade line. Now you don't have that longest trade line anymore. They're looking at your other accounts. Oh, this one's only one year. This credit card is only two years. That hurts you. You actually lose points every month if your trade line 
is like they have a scale. So if your trade line has been open longer than like two to five years, you're in this tier, like a good tier. If your trade line has been open seven to 10 years, you're like in an excellent tier. If your trade line has been open like 12 to 20 years, you're like in a superior tier. And they use this every month when they calculate your credit score because it changes every month. So when I did that, I learned, I said, oh, okay. This is what this is really what's going on. Like you guys are setting people up. You know, and then of course my score dropped and it was some other shit. Oh now your rate changes. Now we're not giving you that whatever two percent or one point nine percent we were giving you when your shit was almost eight hundred. Now we're giving you this point whatever tier a higher rate because your score changed. So it was just like to me it was just a big ass conspiracy. So that's why I'm saying shit has changed. They make it harder for you to invest in real estate if you don't have liquid cash because like, they don't want you making money off of that shit. They, they really don't. The banks don't want you to make money off of your investments. So I would just say, you know, find you a hustle on the side. This rap shit is not cheap. Find you something legit. I'm not knocking anyone's hustle, but eventually you got to be legit and have legitimate residual income because I mean even a lot of these rappers nowadays like you guys think that they only make their money off of shows and no these rappers are are opening businesses these rappers are opening restaurants these rappers are opening clubs these rappers are doing makeup line clothing line you know what I'm saying like investing in real estate buying you know buying the block back so yeah like you got to have more going for you than just show money than just record label money you know and i really hope whoever needs to hear this what's that meme i don't know who needs to hear this but whoever needs to hear this if you do get some advance money please make sure you go buy yours if you don't own a property you live with your mama you live in an apartment the first thing you go buy with that advance money, please don't let it be a chunk of jewelry or a car. Buy you a piece of property first. Pay it off. Be done with it. Whatever money you have left over, I would say start a business, even if it's an online business. Stocks. Invest in something that you don't have to really put too much time and energy in that could build for you, okay? Then whatever money you have left over, yeah, go buy your Bentley truck. Yeah, go buy your fucking Roly or your AP. But just don't be stupid. Because once you spend that money, that shit's not going to be worth what you pay for it. You ain't going to be able to pawn that shit. You can't even go back to the same jeweler that you paid 100000 for that Patek or, or whatever, Patek. You're not going to get even half of that that you pay for it. So... <clears throat> I just think like rappers need to be smart, not just rappers, singers, anybody in the industry, but I'm saying primarily rappers because a lot of rappers come from where? The struggle, right? A lot of rappers come from where? The projects, right? A lot of rappers come from where? Broken homes, right? Okay. So you can have money and still not break the cycle because you can end up broke again next month when you spend that shit. That shit doesn't last. You might, not, you might fall off. You might just have that one hit record. The label might drop you. Your tour might not sell out. You know what I'm saying? Anything could happen. So it's just like with athletes, they need to have a plan B because, you know, they might tear their ACL, you know, might get injured for life and never be able to play ball again. So it's the same thing with rapping. Like, you might be a one-hit wonder. You might only have a one album. You might only have a five-year run or a 10-year run. Who knows? But I just know you don't want to be broke. You don't want to be broke and famous. Did you end up getting that loan? Mm -hmm. After you closed I down the cards? I didn't get the loan because the reason why I didn't get the loan is because I walked away from it. Because the reason I walked away from it is because the interest rate that they were trying to give me was way higher than my original interest rate. And I didn't feel like that was fair. And my credit was shot and I was mad and I was pissed off. And I even called some of my credit card companies and I, they have like a second department. But um, 
it's like a reconsideration line type of shit, customer service. And I'm like, is there any way you can reopen my accounts? I'm like, you know, I was peer pressured into closing. One of my credit cards did reopen the account because it was in like maybe like 30 days. So and I, my um, billing statement hadn't even cycled yet. Like it wasn't even closed out all the way or whatever. So one of them reopened, but the other two wouldn't. They were like, no, once you close it, they leave the remarks on your credit, like close the account, blah, blah, blah. But I didn't end up going with it. Um, so yeah, the rate had changed, okay. Then they were like, yeah, in order for you to get the original rate you have, you had to buy it down. So they wanted me to put like more money down. Like, and it was a lot, like maybe, like damn near 70,000. Like I'd have to put down additional to what I already had in escrow just to get the original rate I had. I'm like, why the fuck, why the fuck am I gonna put 70,000 down when I could use that cash and go try to find some smaller deals, you know, some cheaper shit. The only problem with the cheap shit is you end up having to spend a lot of money to rehab it. You know, when when you can get like a nice turnkey that doesn't need too much work, just maybe some remodeling, and you can sell it and maybe, you know, make you a cool little 80,000, 100,000 profit, 150, 200,000, versus you go buy some shit in the hood, you fix it up, but guess what? The value is still fucked up because it's crack houses or abandoned buildings nearby or the rest of the neighborhood is not up to par. So you didn't invest all that money fixing this shit up, doing an open house, and you can't even sell it for shit because the houses nearby are worth nothing. So, but it was cheap deal, but it's something you're going to have to sit on unless you're going to buy the whole damn block back and renovate the whole damn neighborhood. So... That was my experience, and this just happened to me last year with, um, and it's just, I'm comparing it to like five, eight years ago when it was so easy. Like, you, you low-key, like, I didn't do this, but it was people I knew, they were getting like two mortgages at one time. Because they were closing like within a day or two before the first house was on their credit before the other bank could see that they had bought a house. They were doing this because it was like, then of course you had the scammers, which is another reason why you had the scammers that did this shit on purpose to make it go into foreclosure and never made one single payment, but they just did it to take the equity out the house or to refinance it or whatever. And you know, basically didn't really give a fuck about their credit or is did it just for the money so you know that was going on in back in the days too so this idea that you had originally where you you know went to the people in distress and tried to mm -hmm. work out a deal with them were there other companies that were doing the same business model as you at the time when i was doing it in this per this like okay so i spent majority of my, when I moved here from Jamaica, I spent a majority of my schooling in, like, South Florida, right? Okay. So where I did the real estate was, like, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Davie, Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, Riviera Beach, that area. So at the time when I was making the money, it was, like, in Palm Beach County, that county in particular, Deerfield, Pompano Beach, whoop, whoop, whoop. So there was only, like, there were companies doing this, right? But they were big companies. They were like corporate, like like we buy ugly houses, for example. Like they have like maybe a franchise in every state, you get me? Or in every city they have an office location. So yeah, they were big franchises and they sent out mailers, okay? They were big franchises and companies, investment companies, hard money lenders. They went to the auction every Thursday and they bid. That's how a lot of these investors were buying these houses. They were bidding on them. And you outbid the value because by the time you buy the damn house, you, you didn't outbid all the equity. So there was only like three other people doing what I was doing, like um, the door-to-door -door type thing at the time. I don't know how it is now, so I haven't fucked with it like that. Um, 
I actually thought about doing it again, but I thought about like training some people under me to go out and do the legwork. But then I thought about it. They're just going to go do their own thing, say, fuck me. And, you know, why do I have to work for her? I can do this on my own, you know. So I'm like, that ain't going to work either. But, um, okay, so the three other people at the time that was, we were comp uh, competitors in competition or whatever. Um, yeah, I had to do some research. They had their own firm, investment firm, right? But it was like a smaller mom and pop. But they were all like real estate gurus. Like when I say gurus, I'm talking, I know like one of them was like a billionaire. Like he lived on Palm Beach Island. He had stupid money. And then the other ones were like millionaires. Like they, they had been doing this for years, like probably 20, 30 years, like flipping houses. Like this is what they do. Like this is their niche. Like this is, this is like me. Okay. Somebody learning, somebody young, somebody fresh, somebody spiritual, somebody that was going into these people houses off of their energy, right? Because, listen, I had some people, I had someone let their dog out on me one time. I had somebody wet me up with a water hose. I had somebody pull out a shotgun, a redneck, oh, you're trespassing, I'm gonna shoot you. They're like, they don't know who the fuck you are, what you're doing on their property, what you want, why are you knocking on the door? You know, Florida, you already know it goes down in Florida. Like, they can shoot you and get away with it because you already know what Florida does. You know their laws, okay. So I don't have to get into that. So um, <clears throat> the difference is that with my competition is they were not the ones interacting with these people. They basically were getting college kids, you know, whatever, $10 an hour. Or they were giving them like a referral fee for every property that they got to set up a consultation with. So when they set up the appointment, that's when like the investors would come meet with the people or they go to their office. So back to selling yourself and personality because I feel like genuinely the reason why I was able to close so many deals was because of my personality, you know? Because I had a lady even tell me, like four people knocked on her door this week, you know, trying to, you know, whatever, do the same thing I'm doing. And she was like, she didn't feel, she didn't trust them. She didn't feel like their intentions were good, you know? And she was like, you know, you people don't care about us. You just want our houses. You just want to put us out in the street. You just want us to be homeless. And, um, you know, my approach was different. My approach wasn't, oh, let me just buy your house and kick you out and put you. Like I said, my approach was more like, let's salvage your credit. Let's rebuild. And then, like, two, I even had other properties that were vacant that I, I owned under my company. And whatever. Maybe I wanted to put somebody in it to rent it or I wasn't ready to sell it or I needed to paint it or fix it up or put it on the market, whatever. I, if they needed somewhere to stay, I'm like, okay, I have a, a property, you know, 15 miles from here. It's not a five, six bedroom, beautiful house like yours on a golf course, but you can live there a couple months to get on your feet and you can still have this check. So my approach was like more like... <clears throat> Like, I got to know these people. Like I came in their house, and I got personal with them. Like, you know, it was crazy because, like, one lady, like, I still talk to her now. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Her son is very famous now. But at the time, he's famous. He's a famous individual, okay? He lives out in Cali. But I'm just telling you how, how the world is. She was in foreclosure and she was losing her house. And she was also going to jail. She had a bid to do, okay? So pretty much her kids were about to be without her for a very long time. And um, I did what I had to do, you know. I, I, they were able to, the kids were able to relocate to the West Coast. They had money, they were able to be situated, you know. And, um, I mean, I still communicate with these people. And this is like, you know what I'm saying? This is like 10 years. You know what I mean? This is like a long time. Like, we're still cool. Like, we're not best friends. We're not, but we might associate on Instagram or we might talk. And now her son is a very successful individual. 
in the entertainment industry. And it's just crazy to me because them tables can turn. And just because you're going through a hard patch in life doesn't mean that that's your final destination. Like, you know, a lot of people feel like they're going to be homeless forever. Or they're going to be down, you know, for a long time. But, I mean, some people come into your life for a reason. So it's not always about money. So this was an idea that you came up with or you saw these other companies doing it so you just did it yourself in a different way? Uh-uh. So I knew I wanted to make money. Period. Point blank. I wanted to make money. And I didn't know what I was going to do to make money, right? Mm, I tried a lot of different shit. Like I had got my auction license. I had tried flipping cars. I had invested into a beauty salon at one point with you know other people. And I just couldn't figure out, like, how can I make the, the type of money that I want to make, right? And not have to, it's risky. It's a lot of risk involved, right? Because you have the risk of what if you can't sell the damn house? What if it takes a year? What if it, but <clears throat> my advantage was I always had a tenant in there. So that rent covered the mortgage and I made extra six, seven hundred dollars a month, so I wasn't mad. But how my idea came along was, I said, I'm gonna go to the auction and, and start investing in real estate. Because you know, you watch these seminars on TV, they're like, oh, you can go buy the tax bill, or you can buy a house for $3,000, all you gotta do is buy the tax bill and the judgment, you know, so people made it seem like it was like, oh, you could just go buy a house at the auction. So that's where I had got my whole dream like oh this is something i can do with little or no money right so i started going to the courthouse doing my own research so that's how i found out that you can actually get what's called a list pending which is an lp before it goes to what's called a judgment state a judgment state is an actual auction date like okay this house is going to be auctioned december 31st at 10 a.m this thursday at the courthouse. Then they publicly post it in the newspaper every Sunday. So it's public record, okay? This ain't nothing. I ain't telling y'all no secret. This shit's public record. So I started going to these auctions. I went to about maybe 30 auctions. And guess what? I didn't buy shit. You know why? I didn't have the money to. Because how they do it at the auction, I'll tell you why I couldn't buy shit. <laughs> At the auction, it was like, okay, let's say this person owed Bank of America or HSBC or Chase 250000 right? That's the amount of the loan principal. Then let's say with the interest, the late fees, attorney fees, whatever they wanted to tack on, they owe another 50000 right? So now you're at 300000 right? Let's say the house, the comps... Let's say the house is worth 420000 So you're like, damn, okay, I'm going to buy this house for sure because I'm going to make $120,000 profit. Wham. When you go on the auction, when they start the bid, they're starting that motherfucker off at 300000 because the bank wants their money, right? They want all their fucking money, okay? Sometimes you can negotiate, like, on the late fees and the interest, but they want the principal for sure. Like, they want that paid off. So I'm in the auction, everybody's doing this, putting their, you know, their bid, right? And my ass is just sitting there with my notebook. I'm making notes, I'm listening, I'm looking, I'm observing. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I only have $50,000 to play with cash that I can go get a cashier's check or a money order. Cause you gotta pay that shit at the end of the business day by 5 p.m. If you don't pay it, guess what? It ain't your house, okay? So I found out that this auction is a cash deal. You, like, you need all the money to buy the house. Then I also noticed, like, some people wanted the house so bad for whatever reason. Maybe it's the location. Maybe how the house looked. Maybe it was a beachfront. Maybe it was a waterfront. That they were outbidding the equity in the house. And when I say outbidding, we already said 300000 what the bank wants to pay off. We already said the house is worth 420000 We already said there's $120,000 
possible profit. That's not guaranteed because you probably don't sell the house for that. You probably sell it for less. You probably might have to put 30000 into rehab. But you don't know the condition of the house because you haven't really seen the inside yet, especially if people are still living in it. So you don't know if it needs new plumbing. You don't know if it needs a new roof. You haven't had a, an inspection. You're buying this shit based off of comps and driving by the property. You like the exterior. So I noticed a lot of the investors in there they wanted the property so bad that it was two investors. They bid it for like an hour on this one property. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Finally, one of the guys like, ah, fuck that. I tap out. This older dude. He was like realizing they were up to like damn near 400000 You know what I'm saying? And they were still going back and forth. So the, when the dude backed out, the other dude the one that was going back and forth with him that won the house, he was looking like, um, looking at the other guy to see if, you know, he was about to say something else again. The dude was like, nah, bro, that's all you. So he was like, fuck. You know what I'm saying? And then I saw that and I peeped that and I'm like, hmm. like he probably regrets doing that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like he was like, fuck. Like, fuck. Under his breath, but it was like, you know, you could hear it like everyone in the room was like because we felt his pain so i went to about 20 of those because i'm like oh maybe i'll get it you know maybe i'll be able to buy something small like a little condo or some land or never every time i went to the auction i couldn't afford shit nothing not even a bottle of water so i'm like this is not how i'm gonna make my money because this shit's all a fucking cap all that shit about buying the um the sales tax and all that shit, you got to pay off all them goddamn liens and you still got to worry about the, the mortgage company. So you you just bought a, a tax lien, but it, it's a bunch of bullshit. That's a whole nother story. So anyways, <clears throat> I said, there's got to be a way that I can get to these houses before these investors bid on them. So that's where I got the bright idea. Why don't I go to the list pendings, right? These are the new cases list pending before they have an actual sales date. Why don't I go talk to these people when they're maybe like three, four months in versus a year in or, or damn near a week, like about to lose their house. So <clears throat> it gave me a little bit of an advantage because I have more time to, to work with these people and try to help their situation. And another thing we used to do, and I, I mean, it's good and bad, but like I would do hard money lending. So I'd be like, okay, I don't want your house then. You know, if you have memories and you're um, attached to the house, then okay, you need to borrow this 50,000 from me, fine. I don't care about your credit. I'm not pulling your credit. I don't, I don't care about your income, your money. I'm gonna lend you this 50,000 with 150% return or whatever on top. It's called a hard money loan. So yeah, I'm gonna lend you the money, but you gotta give me back 150,000 within however many years, whatever, right? And just give me a scenario. One of the contingencies were, if you were ever late one time or missed a payment, I had the deed already. That was a collateral, okay? So no, I wasn't going off of your credit. No, I wasn't going off of your income. I didn't even give a fuck. If you, if I knew you couldn't pay the, the 4,000 or 5,000, however much it was monthly with the interest, I didn't care about that. I was looking at, okay, you want to keep your house, you know, but some things are not realistic. So some people don't want to let go. They rather live beyond their means or <clears throat> instead of just downgrading or downsizing and saving themselves stress and peace of mind. So I did those type of deals too. And unfortunately, yeah, I had to take people to court, you know, but I had the deed, so I won and I had contracts. And unfortunately, I still was never, a, you know, a dickhead or a bitch about it, you know, because I knew, you know what I'm saying? I just knew this was gonna be a longer process. So the $50,000 that I gave them is gone because they've been paying me back the payments with that loan, right? I know they can't pay me back the interest. So I'm still sympathetic to like, okay, 
I let you live in the house another six months rent free to get a job, get on your feet, you know, while I put it on the market and try to sell it. Yeah, I have the deed. It's my house now, but I still have a heart. Like, I'm not putting you out on the street homeless. Or if I had another property vacant somewhere, I'll let them live there, you know, just because I, I wasn't I wasn't in it to fuck people over. I wasn't in it. It wasn't just all about the money, you know, because you could actually help people like you have a second shot, you know, and do something positive and still make money. You know, there's there's things you can do and make good money and not have to fuck nobody over or scam nobody or you know, or you can help somebody get on their feet or give them an opportunity for a second chance. Because I know if these people have these foreclosures on their credit, they're not going to be able to buy shit for seven years. They're not going to be able to buy a car. So why not help them? Like, I mean. So I guess what I'm asking is when you had come up with this idea, did you already know this stuff companies were already doing already? Or you started of to... Of course, I knew. Oh, you did. I knew companies were out there. I knew because what I once I, I was going to the courthouse for like six months before I even tried it. So you know you meet people, you network, and I saw what was going on. Like I learned, like okay, like this is how these people make their living. You come to the courthouse every week, you know. And I knew that I wasn't the only person knocking on people's door. Sometimes I would go to a house and I would see like two, three brochures. You know, we'll buy your house cash or we'll save your foreclosure. And um, some odd reason, people were just opening the door for me. You know? Like one time we went to this neighborhood and it was about 10 foreclosures. And there was a guy doing the same thing I was doing. And we were all going to the same house, of course, because we're all going off the same list. So as he would go to these houses, like I'm going down my addresses and this is in one cul-de-sac, it's like 10 foreclosures. So I'm literally going to every house he's just leaving because that's just what's going on. Like we're, we're all going after the same house. So I'm going to the door. And so, you know, my friends like, no one's going to answer the door. No one's home. Look at all them flyers. You know, no one's home. So she's like, just leave the, she was my assistant at the time. She's like, just leave the flyer on the door and let's go. Or in the mailbox, right? But no, nah, my persistent ass, I, anybody there? Like, I want to make sure no one's home. Like, are you asleep? Ding, ding. Like, I'm ringing the doorbell. Like, I'm, you know, in people's window, like being nosy, fresh, what we would call in Jamaica. So I'm like, I know somebody's in there. Five minutes later, someone opens the door. What do you want? But they didn't open the door to the three people before me. You know, I don't know if it was out of curiosity or if it was out of, you know, I don't know. But was it your looks? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it, they were intrigued or curious or what does she want? You know what I'm saying? What does she possibly want? Like... <laughs> You know, I don't know what it was, but the thing about it is you only have 30 seconds to shoot your shot once they open that damn door. You did, you did, uh, were you going to say something there? No, I just said like, from the moment, it's just like a phone call, like with telemarketers. You got like 10 seconds to spit your pitch out before you get hung up on. And it's the same thing, like people were slamming the door in my face. It's like, I got to tell you why I'm here in 10 seconds before you slam the door in my face. That was the situation. So you said you did dress uh, business casual. Did you ever try to dress a little bit more provocative? To Hell no. I was scared. I was scared. I'll tell you why I was scared. I was scared of a situation where I'm knocking on someone's door and maybe the wife answers the door mm. or the husband answers the door and the wife is there looking at me. And um, it's not a good look business-wise when, when you're dealing with, especially married couples or whatever. It just brings the wrong um, message. It doesn't seem like I'm there for my business, like I'm about my business. It seems like I'm there on some other shit. <laughs> like, oh. you know, it, no, like I'm, I'm saying like people, one, they're not going to take you serious. Two, the wife could be jealous. 
or three, the husband might, you know, say something flirty or something, you know, rude or make an advancement and it could blow the whole deal. Like you just blew $200,000 deal because the wife is jealous of you. So she doesn't want to have a set up a meeting next week. She don't want her husband, you know, going to lunch with the attorney because you're going to be there, you know, just stupid shit like that. So, you know, that type of shit is appropriate when you're in the music industry. Yeah, like you're going to a concert or you got a show, you're performing. Yeah, you could wear that type of shit. But this this is like like how I used to dress. <clears throat> I would wear like some slacks, like business slacks, maybe like a nice white collared button down shirt and a blazer over it with like a scarf around my neck or like a nice pin or something like that and some loafers. That was my attire. At these auctions, did the bank buy some of their uh, houses back? Never. No, what they do is they'll do what's called a short sale. So let me explain a short sale to you. A short sale is, this is up to the bank's discretion. Some of them do it, some of them don't. Some of them will maybe put the house in the MLS to where realtors have access to it. And instead of wanting the $300,000 payoff, they'll say, okay, short sale for $220,000 because they cut whatever, some of those fees and bullshit. So that's like a short sale. But the thing with a short sale is that's exactly what it is, a short sale. You don't have time to do like a preliminary closing to where you got to do the whole title surge, the, you know, like the whole eight week process. This is like more quick, like you really have maybe two weeks to close or 30 days. It just depends on the date of the sale. So it's a lot of short sales here, like in Gwinnett, in Georgia. Like all you got to do is go on Zillow and click short sale and you'll see all the properties listed and the bank will like sell it for whatever half or a quarter of what is owed on the house. So, but mostly you have to have cash for that shit too. So just depends. Depends on the bank.